Uh, okay, yes. So I am sitting in for Dr. Clannon. Uh, Dr. Clannon and I have worked together since the early 90s. Um, and we worked together um, running, creating and running the HIV clinic at Highland Hospital in Oakland. So um, over the course of that time, we really struggled, as I know everybody here probably does, um, with the difficulty of um, accessing mental health and substance use services for the people that we were trying to take care of. So that's basically what this topic is about, is some of what we discovered on our journey to try trying to figure out how to do that better. Um, next slide. So um, this is um, one, just to put in mind, one kind of a case, but I am guessing that everyone here can think of someone, uh, I'd like to ask you to think of someone in your practice who has a mental health and, and or a substance use issue that significantly affects their ability to stay healthy. And to think about how you are currently, your clinical team currently hire, handles that kind of situation. Next slide. So just to be clear, um, when, when we refer to behavioral health, we are talking about both mental health and substance use um, conditions. And um, all kinds of things that are related to uh, behavioral health. And as we, we talk about it here, really whole person care. Um, it's especially important in situations where we are taking care of people with chronic diseases like HIV, because um, in situ with, with a chronic disease, the behavior often is really essential to affecting the um, treatment success. So attending to emotion, meaning, culture, and that whole, the whole person affects people's ability to um, go along with their treatment, to partner with you um, in, um, in making changes that affect their success. Um, there's all kinds of levels of need, but for today, we're really thinking about the high levels, the highest levels of need for behavioral health. Next slide. So um, again, sometimes I feel like you all know this already. We are dealing with um, a structural situation where historically in our, in our society and uh, th there's a there's a big divide between medical care and mental health, and actually this really this slide really should say three because substance use, uh, even though we we up put it under the umbrella of behavioral health, substance use is very much in its own world and very segregated from mental health as well. So um, we have been we're structurally set up to divide these things and to in fact not be able to easily care for people in who are needing services in two very separate or three very separate systems. Um, next slide. So this is the slide that I really want to pause on for a minute. And um, I wonder, can, every, can people read this slide? Is, is it clear enough that you can see the... Um, so I want to take a minute and let you read the slide. Um, so I'm going to be quiet for a minute, a moment, while you take a look at that. So, so as you can see, it's basically, you know, your standard kind of high, low quad. And um, it helps us to think about um, different levels of need and how they work together. So our focus um, in when we think about where the most critical need for integrated care is, is in quadrant two and four, um, and primarily in quadrant four. So you're taking care of people with HIV who overwhelmingly um, generally do have high physical needs and quite a, quite a few will also have high behavioral health needs. So um, that's where this, this um, scheme, it's really a, just a schematic. It's not really designed to be uh, you know, a prescription, but it gives you um, a, sort of a mechanism for thinking about each client and where are, where are your, where's your panel where do they fall? And you could take a you could take a population health 
angle and, and think about your overall panel and where they fall in, this, in these four quadrants, if you find that you have um, maybe 10%, 20%, maybe it's a much larger number, who fall in what you would put quadrant four, then you can think about that set of people and, and how you can address the behavioral health needs for that. But one of the things that um, it's just really important to remember is we don't need to have that intensive integrated care for every patient, even though, I mean, it would be ideal, right? Every patient would be best taken care of in, in, a, in an integrated way. But for the purposes of, um, for the purposes of uh, making changes in your practice that might require some investment, you can really think about the most intensive. Um, so some of the key takeaways from looking at this um, slide, and then when we get to the discussion, I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts about, uh, you know, where do you, where do your clients fall? Um, everyone doesn't need the same level of intensity. Intensity, um, and very often for that last 10% of people that you are trying to reach and you've been not able to reach because of um, mental health and substance use issues, the solution for each one is going to be different. It's probably not, um, it's probably not uh, going to be a cookie cutter approach. Um, and um, also another thing that's in, important to think about in, the, in terms of this, these boxes is that people don't stay in one box. You know, darn them. They don't like, you know, you can't like put them in a box and keep them there you have to kind of be able to react, reflect, and you know, sort of flex depending on you know, if someone comes into a crisis, they show up at psych emergency, then you're going to want to um, heighten your attention to the behavioral health um, uh, interventions. Um, okay, next slide. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the different sort of some different forms of integration because there really is a, a, a continuum um, at, that uh, along a variety of, of um, in a variety of ways. One of which is how intensive of a of a change in your system do you need to make? And the good news is you don't actually necessarily have to have like a big system integration to make a difference. So people generally talk about these three levels of, uh, of integration, a coordinated model where um, the systems are still very separate, but there's communication, um, a co-located model where you actually have behavioral health professionals in a primary care setting or vice versa, primary care clinicians in a behavioral health setting, a specialty behavioral health setting. And then um, a collaborative model, which is really sort of the, you know, the most possible integration where you and the behavioral health clinicians are really seeing the same panel of patients as a team. Um, next slide. This is sort of a different uh, uh, look at the same three levels. Um, so you can see, um, so, in the coordinated version, um, you're going by referral. Um, and the, the most critical element for all of these different levels of integration is communication. And we all know, I think communication is very hard. Even if you're in the same room, communication can be hard, but it's especially hard when you are in very different systems. So focusing on how you get that information exchange. It can be by referral, and in that case, it's reaching out to the providers and building relationships and, and figuring out how you can exchange information uh, about a, a, common, a client that you have in common. Um, it can be there on site in a separate office or maybe it's on a different floor. And um, we certainly experienced in many, many big institutions, you, you, you may have a behavioral health department, but it does not, being co-located does not make it um, necessarily any easier without intervention. And then finally, really having people integrated into the same team. Um, next slide. Uh, I think, yeah, okay. 
So this is where, um, so a little bit more about what coordinated care looks like. Um, what you can do when it's really, you're not even in the same system, you can arrange for communication around whether people arrived for their appointment or not, did they make it. Um, develop protocols for making sure that you are uh, exchanging important clinical information, for instance, prescriptions. Um, if people oftentimes are, are very worried about um, drug interactions and really need to feel some confidence that, that they know what is being prescribed and how that, that works together. Um, ultimately, ideally, coordinated treatment planning um, and problem solving with a part, really kind of developing a partnership with a, with a behavioral health clinician. Um, there are a lot of cultural barriers, and when I say cultural, I mean professional culture. There's a tremendous, um, uh, and again, I know you, you all probably know this as best, as, as well or better than I do, but the kind of cultural differences between social workers and physicians and their communication style, um, and even the language. Um, in primary care, people tend to think when you say clinician, it's a prescriber, but in the behavioral health world, a clinician is a therapist. Um, so, we, you know, paying attention to respectful use of language, all of that is a big learning curve. Um, in a primary care setting, people move very, very quickly. Communication is very brusque. In behavioral health, it tends to be much more thoughtful, slower. Um, people can get frustrated with those communication issues. Um, uh, and then finally, um, the way that you think about the treatment plan, um, including behavioral health. Next slide. So here, co-located, co especially in the HIV world, helps to reduce stigma because people don't, um, uh, well, I guess I should, you know, mental, there's mental health stigma, there's HIV stigma. If it's all in one place where people are, feel very comfortable, it's sometimes removes a barrier. Um, so here, I'm going to let you take a look at the slide, um, the advantages and challenges. Um, so one of the things that we find is it still makes, it's still the relationships that get are developed between the providers are still critically important, um, even if you have them on the same site. I think we talked about that. Um, next slide. And then finally, the most integrated model, which I think is still pretty rare, is when you have a behavioral health consultant that's really right in the team, in the primary care setting. Um, and uh, this often takes a, a, a lot of time to get to the point where you have created this because it really requires hiring decisions, space planning, uh, even the physical space, the way physical space is used. Um, but it can be the, the most whole person um, way. And I, I actually wanted uh, to tell you about a really great conference that's on the subject of integrated behavioral health, and I can send a, a link to you all later. But um, uh, a lot of the slides come from people who work on um, who have been working for a few decades on the on the challenges of integrating care? It's called the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. They have a they have an annual conference, and this year it's in Denver, October 17th to 19th. And one of the things that's really great about that conference is it that both physical and behavioral health clinicians and um, professionals come to that conference and really focus on on the state of the art in terms of you know, data, results, models, um, at, 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 and um, it's a great, it's actually a great conference. So I wanted to mention that it's one of the places where we got a lot of the ideas that are in this slide, this uh, slide deck. Um, so next slide. Mm, this, we already looked at, yeah. So really now we're at the um, point of discussion and um, want you to think about how do your patients get behavioral health um, services and are there any ideas in this set um, in what the slides that we've seen that you might be able to uh, begin to implement? 
So what do you guys think? We have just a couple of moments here. Um, does anybody want to talk about what you've done or some ideas to improve your coordination with boots on the ground? And feel free to go ahead and put in the chat room. I know we've talked about um, uh, integrating some behavioral health into the primary care. Does anybody have any thoughts? So Don talks a, a little bit about um, using the one-stop model. So you've got the clinic, you've got mental health and substance abuse in one, one building. I'd be, so, um, Don, I'd be yeah. interested to hear from Don uh, about how that works and do they find that they are able to um, really work closely together given they have the services in one building? And what kind of challenges? Hi. Um, so, I mean, it seems to work out awesome because we're all on the same, um, ours is called MedEnt. So mental health can see this, um, notes and information um, from the clinic and substance abuse. And we all can look if, and, you know, follow up on the patient. So if there's something going on, say, in their medical visit and maybe they need to speak to their counselor, it can be then triaged directly to the counselor. Maybe the counselor can come downstairs. Um, same thing with mental health. If they're at a mental health visit and maybe they need to, something's going on and they need to speak with the primary physician, they can be triaged down or they can be walked down to either clinic. So it seems to work great that everything is in one building. The clients tend to have all their appointments maybe on one day so they don't have to keep coming mm -hmm. back and forth. Um, so it seems to work great for our patients. You have the same um, health record that you look at? Yes, it's called yeah. MedEnt. That makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And um, in California, you're not allowed to bill for a behavioral health visit that happens on the, in Medi-Cal that happens on the same day as a physical health bill, uh, visit, which is a big barrier for integration, but maybe it's not that way where you are. Well, uh, I believe it, it is, but um, yeah. That's a yeah. problem. Yeah. It is, but yeah. I mean, um, again, I think it, I don't know how they figure it out. I don't know. I don't ask questions in that yeah. area, but. It, it works. That's great. All right. So I know we don't have a lot of time in here. We do have a couple other ideas and thoughts as well. I know that actually Katie and Tiffany had commented in the chat room about their integrated behavioral health that is being implemented. And we're going to be actually hearing about from them in their case presentation. And they do touch on um, this whole piece about mental health services as part of their presentation. And I know that Nishi also talked about the loss to care team um, concept that we have in there. So some good dialogue going in here. What I'd say is let's go ahead and continue the chat about different ways that you've integrated your behavioral health services, and then we'll go ahead and go to the next slide so we can just go ahead and do a wrap up here. Great. Oh, so um, so this is just, you know, to say kind of just what people have been talking about, that having that new data system allows um, people to, the, the providers to share information um, and also the mental health case manager now can come actually with her to the clinic and um, having that level of intervention available, that level of support, it makes a really big difference in terms of the um, outcomes for that. Excellent. And final slide, I think you have one more. Oh, it's just the end there. Mm -hmm. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's kind of a short and sweet presentation, but I think it's really helpful to set the stage and for us to remember, um, you know, there's so many different aspects with behavioral health services and really getting us thinking about how do we integrate it. And then I, I really like your slide, Nancy, that you had that talked about the three, that the true evolution of moving towards um, integrated um, care. In some settings, it may just be coordinated. Other times, it can be co-located. And the ideal that we're striving for is integrated. Does anybody have any final questions or comments for Nancy before she has to jump up off the call? Christian, go ahead and take the slides off, please, and let's just see if we have any remaining questions. I think the main, um, the main point is whatever level your system is at, there's something that you can do, whether it's just a provider to provider or you're really able to put all the services in one place. 
Agree. And Nancy, let me ask you one final question. I know that the AETCs have created that, um, the assessment for your level of integration with behavioral health services is the readiness assessment. Have mm -hmm. you seen that and have you used that at all? I have not, no. Okay. Dr. Flynn, all right. sure does know, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, I know that I had shared that at one of our earlier calls when we were talking about behavioral health services. If you haven't seen it, and if your organization is taking a look at it to really see where you're at, it's a nice set of questions that allow you to look at it from a system-wide organizational standpoint to see how you're actually set up right now and where you are in this process. It asks questions about, have you thought about it? Have you been talking about it? Do you actually have a plan? And have you put something into place? So it allows you to see where you are in the continuum. So thank you, Nancy. Let's give her a great big round of applause. So, <laughs> thank thanks you. for joining the call and That's I hope you enjoyed the rest thank of the day. Thanks All so right. much, Nancy. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So Christian, can you pull up the slides? So we are going to move from our didactic presentation and we're going to now go into the case presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie and Tiffany from the University of Toledo Medical Center. Take it away. Um, I'm Tiffany, I'm a quality and data assistant. I'm Katie Himmich, I'm the program director here. And we're just gonna talk to you a little bit about our um, presentation, or our case, I'm sorry, our project with the Black and African American Latina women. If we could have the next slide, please. 